All right, so uh, fresh review in our history class. You might recall that what men learn from history is that men never learn from history, as I always like to say. We have finished the timeline pretty much uh, where we're wrapping up Laodicea. Laodicea is a time period of so much comfort, remember, uh, so rich need of nothing. But now that became a double-edged sword where their comfort now has become their destruction. In a day and age of Laodicea, where they're too full and they uh, live the way that they want to, lost in their success, then it becomes a point where everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, remember. Now this is turning into chaos. And then it's the cycles repeating where it's going back to a one king. Remember in our history, uh, we've seen how in the past discipleship lessons, people were bound by a socialist or a communist or a one king system, a monarchy. And now it's switched to an independent mindset, America. But then the independence has a price where they're so lost in their flesh, the loss of their flesh, it's turning into chaos. And the book of Judges says that's not going to last forever. What's going to happen is they're going to seek after a king. So we're now at that timeline. We've talked about revised Christianity. Oh, uh, not like that. There we go. We've talked about revised Christianity with their revised version and their revised dispensationalism. And a lot of that has messed up doctrine and the right book. Through revised dispensationalism, revised version, and then the revised culture, revised Christianity movement, doctrine is getting lost. And the world is becoming more of what I always keep saying, a Catholic, communist culture. That's where we're heading toward. From this Catholic, communist culture, the Lord raised up uh, last day heroes. And if it weren't for Jack Chick and Peter Uckman, I believe that uh, a lot of us would not be able to ha be armed with the knowledge we know or even be here. So against revised Christianity, the Lord raised up Jack Chick and Peter Ruckman, and they turned the tide a lot for the Bible-believing movement. Because of these two men, the gospel was able to spread out. The world's system was finally being attacked. Now remember, the world system from this Catholic communist culture comes through three tools. The three tools, you might recall, if you have this, then you can control the world. They are government. You need the power of the military. You need to enforce laws. And then you can change the society. You need schools where they give education, higher ed, the PhD empirical research and papers to back up their statements, their arguments, to convince the next generation with their brainwashing. And then media. Once you enter into every TV, radio, internet, cell phone, then people are exposed to that with uh, wrong information, propaganda. These three tools uh, from combined with the power of Hollywood, government, and the teachers, they were able to successfully brainwash the generations and provide a Catholic communist culture. But Jack Chick and Peter Ruckman, the Lord used mainly these two men where they were able to come back and attack these uh, three tools that provided a Catholic communist culture. But now that they've passed away, the concern is... Who's going, who is the Lord going to raise up to attack them? Well, uh, you might recall that during, after they passed away, which is around 2016, and that is coincidence in the timing, 2016, as soon as they passed away, that's when uh, the post-truth phenomenon spread out. 
So people who like to be known as truthers. So because of the power of the internet that the devil used, it became like a double-edged sword. This is the medium because it provided public access. So truthers, once they have uh, freedom to access it, they can be broken off from the chains of the world. Now think about it. Truthers or common people don't have access to this or this. You notice that? They don't have that. They don't have that advantage. But they have this through internet. Think about it. If they didn't have access to internet, wonder how much more propaganda would have been spread, right? Think about uh, a good number of you, how you found Bible-believing truth. Because you had access to this. So this became a double-edged sword. The devil used this where it successfully made them more fleshly, more lost, uh, more corrupt. But also, it got people to find out truth. People were able to post truth and people were able to find out truth. So at least they had access to that. So that's the good news. The Lord at least knew that this phenomenon would happen at the same time they pass away. So then he didn't really need these two men to be able to spread it out when these people, they can search it for themselves. So that's the good news. However, remember the devil, uh, that's his domain, the internet. We've seen the history of the internet. CERN was involved for its beginnings, you might recall. Uh, military schools. Uh, they were involved in its beginnings. So that's not a good start. The Lord Jesus Christ did not find www.com for you. It was the devil that did all that. So because of that, obviously, even though they have access, there's a consequence, there's confusion. So it's truth mingled with lies. So because, that's how the devil always deceives people is not by lying, it's by mingling lies with truths. So people, when they think that they found the truth, oh, the government's so evil and wicked, then they mess up into a lie. They become anti-Semite, or uh, they, they deny dispensationalism, or they think that all other Bible versions are okay. So this, uh, so this medium has been very confusing. And then I mentioned about how some Bible believers were able to get involved and be able to filter it out. Uh, the Lord used our channel as an example, so as an example, to help out uh, clear and filter this out. Now, there are others out there that the Lord has used, but because, I'm uh, because of our church, I'm more familiar with what we were involved with, so I'm just using us as an example. Now... Now that I left off over here, okay, so Bible believers, let's see, I think while well, I'm going to write it, that way I can provide, well, actually, I can move more toward that side. So Bible believers have carried on the torch from what these two men laid out. They kept uh, planting churches. They never quit. They were uh, starting Bible institutes. So that is a good combat against the school system, you notice, right? So they were doing institutes. They were still passing out Bible-believing materials. So track distribution. Or tracking, we can call it. That is very powerful through especially the pictures from Jack Chick Comics uh, that we were able to keep spreading out Bible-believing truth. Dr. Uckman's books were being uh, spread out where people's eyes are opening to dispensational truth. Also, some of them are getting involved in the Internet. And then I mentioned our church as an example. So that helped a lot of people to open their eyes on the truth. And then missions, that is extremely important. Yeah. So then we see uh, Dr. Kyle Stevens with Campaigns for Christ as one, of, uh, as one important thing where they're helping us spreading missions. The Bible Baptist Mission, uh, founded by the late Dr. Ruckman, 
they're spreading out missionaries. Our church, we finally are able to get involved now where we're going to start traveling and then uh, help out the missionaries. We give a huge sum of money to Campaigns for Christ. So <clears throat> this is probably the most important thing. So this is the means we've been doing that helps combat this thing. See that? So now we're attacking. So this is the best means what we've done to attack it. Now, the problem with our Bible believers, which is what I mentioned over and over again, is that these things are so successful where we're finally attacking the devil's system now, opening people's eyes to the truth, but the devil now is getting Bible believers where they are attacking each other instead which is very stupid. And this one, unfortunately, is one of the biggest reasons, is internet. You might say, why is that? Because everyone's typing whatever they want. <clears throat> everyone's typing whatever they want. And then they just fuss about the silliest things, uh, nitpicking on doctrines and etc. So they're attacking each other, and they, in, while they're focusing on attack, attacking the, each other, they have the audacity to side more with the IFB who have been influenced by this system, revised Christianity. So they're holding hands more with IFB while they're attacking their fellow Bible-believing peers? Now, that's the problem with us Bible believers that I want to leave in our last history lesson is, where are you at in the fight? Against each other? Because you have your own spiritual convictions and all Bible believers should follow you how you do things? Because you're the next Dr. Peter S. Ruckman everybody looks up to. You're the one that carries on the mantle, the torch. And then you want everyone to follow the way that you do things? And then Bible believers who separate and distance from each other rather than uniting, and instead they hold hands more with IFB? Why? Because they're more loving while my Bible-believing peers are more unloving. Well, that's very <laughs> hypocritical of you. You're unloving where you don't work it out with them, the Bible believers, and you're more willing to work it out with them, the IFB, who are influenced by the revised Christianity. You know, that disgusts me. So that's why I've been pounding sometimes on my Bible-believing brethren when we're reaching the most recent part of our history. You might say, why? Because we're the movement God's using. So I'm urging my fellow Bible-believing peers, we're the last denomination, we're the last movement that's standing for the Lord till Jesus comes. We're the best group. If there was a better group than us, I'd join that group. I wouldn't join your group. Why do you think I'd stick with this group? No matter how many scandals, corruptions, or problems, or mistakes, or pride issues that uh, my Bible-believing peers have, this is the best family. This is the best team I got. Any other team out there is far worse. Far worse. So that's why I'm sticking to this bunch. If there was a better team out there, then I'd join that bunch. So that's the reason why I'm... I'm urging my Bible-believing peers because I'm still on your same side. I'm not against you. I'm still on your same side, but I'm trying to get you guys to open your eyes and realize I'm getting on you guys because get your act together. We're on the same team. Get your act together. We're on the same team. And we're supposed to spread Bible-believing truth. Those that are being watered down uh, by the IFB, holding hands with them, you're, you're on troubling ground to me. You're on troubling ground to me. Uh, that's a huge problem. Now, this is where we're at, and the Lord raised up champions in the last days to combat that. And I'm going to cover them very, very soon, all right? But before I cover them, I need to explain where this is headed toward. So remember, we're right here, okay? This is what we're attacking, okay? The devil, he has something set up for now, uh, let me see right here. This is better. That way there's no confusion. Uh, okay. For now, what you're seeing 
is the media, which is one of the tools of the devil, where public people have access where we can still spread out truth. So that's a wonderful thing. So that's where our ministry comes in. We're helping out these Bible believers through this means and other means to keep spreading it. But remember, it's building up lies more and more. Pretty soon, this thing is going to be controlled by... And what this will lead, all right? Now, I'm going to give you the quotations to prove it, but follow me while I'm going to show you. This is the end of our history that I'm going to show to you. This is our last history lesson. Pretty soon, people, remember, they have what they perceive to be free choice, right? So here is free choice. That has been the number one thing that the Lord has used where people are able to break free from the, um, from the devil's grip. They have the freedom to access this powerful tool. No longer are elitists having the only access to this powerful tool. Think about it. If, we, if everyone had the freedom to access these three things, do you know how much would change the globalist agenda? It would break it. It would pretty much break it. If we had access to this, if Bible-believing Christians had access and power to this, freedom to do this, do you know how much we'd probably save our country? We'd save our country. But this is now, uh, this access where we have the freedom will no longer become freedom. It will become controlled. What you're going to think to be free choice is simply actually a delusion. You're going to think you have free choice to have access to the truth. But in reality, it's all controlled by this system. And this system will control what you're watching, the information you're studying. And what you think to be truth, it's actually the information that this guy wants to give to you. So in other words, the freedom of access of information is now gone. It's, not, it's, really, it's actually a delusion. You might think it's freedom because you're still selecting, you're watching. But AI knows exactly what, uh, what, what you desire, what information can uh, trick you, and as a matter of fact, Facebook and Google and uh, these tech founders, they all admitted it. They all admitted that they control information. Yep. They give information what they want to give to the people. They want to get rid of fake news. They deliberately give, contradict, uh, vi uh, they give videos that debunk the information that you're searching for truth. They even do that. So their freedom, free choice is becoming more of a delusion now. And AI is taking more control, which means then that it will be manipulated. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Think about this. This AI then is so powerful it controls everybody. Who can control it? Okay, so then elites think they can control it. So they're proposing government. They're proposing uh, the big founders to be held more accountable, and then they control more. So elites are controlling it. However, the elites think they're controlling it. Who's the one controlling the elites? The devil. He's the god of this world. He gives the kingdom to whomsoever he will. So think about this. If he gets, all he has to do is get his hands on this. And you think that's difficult for him? Once he gets his hand on this, here you are searching for truth, thinking you found truth, but in reality it was controlled by... Isn't that the devil's job to make you think you found Christianity? You found Jesus Christ? You found the truth of the word of God, but in actuality, in reality, it's actually fake Christianity, a fake Bible, a fake right doctrine, a fake Jesus. Isn't Antichrist known as a fake Christ? 
See, that's the thing. A lot of people don't think about that. Now, uh, let's look at the Word of God. The Bible warns about that in Ephesians chapter 3. If I'm going to make this the last history lesson, I better speed things up here. <laughs> All right. So in Ephesians chapter 3, the Word of God uh, reads right here, chapter 2, excuse me. It'll be chapter 2. Notice verse 2. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. All right, so you're following the way of the world. The way of the world is that internet thing, remember. That's, that internet is one of its most powerful tools. According to the prince of the power of the air. Ah, Satan's controlling however way this world is going. So you betcha the devil's in charge. Also, he's connected to the power of the air. It's not difficult for him to control electronics, electricity. But notice at the same time that through this electricity, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It provides an evil spirit that goes inside and then it actually controls them. Have you ever seen one of your kids just uh, messing around with electronics all day long, video games, stuff like that, and it seems like they're not their own? It doesn't seem to be your kid anymore. That, that free choice seems to be gone. It's like a different person or a different spirit. You ever notice a dark spirit behind people who get in that all day long? More grouchy, not really social with people. They're not really more active. They could get more depressed. See, that's a dark spirit over there. Notice in verse 3, also, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. That's what electronics does. That's what uh, internet does. It pleases our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So Satan's in control of all of that. Then think about this. What, what does this ultimate lead to? ultimately lead to technology. This ultimate technology can easily then lead to this, see? It can easily endorse this. By the way, some of you don't know this, but some people say that 666 actually represents... You ever wondered about that? Strange stuff. Strange stuff. It won't be long now, then the Antichrist, that's how he can control people through the mark of the beast, is he will use the internet. He will use AI to fulfill that goal. Now, I'm going to sh show you proof through uh, even liberal scholars. They'll admit it, okay? I'm going to continue reading Yuval Noah Harari's book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. It's incredibly eye-opening uh, what he said right here. About, the, about people who are just uh, so much into technology and then they become no longer of their own. They become no longer of their own. They become deceived. Okay, so let's see right here. I will switch it to the iPad. That way y'all can read that and see what's going on through documented quotes. All right, Yuval Noah Harari's book on page uh, 328. He says, people imagine that they make these choices freely. Ideologies such as liberalism and capitalism encourage people to think that way. So remember, uh, Yuval Noah Harari says there are three stories that dominated our world. It's communism, liberalism, and fascism. In the end, liberalism won, right? But liberalism now has its two veins, where you get the conservative side and the left-wingers. So he's talking about right here those two sides within liberalism. So when he talks about liberalism here, he's talking about the left-wing side, capitalism, the right-wing side. But he's talking about still nevertheless this story, that one at the end, the liberalism story, which we're in. This makes people very incurious about themselves. As long as I think that my choices reflect my free will, I have no incentive to investigate what made me choose this or that. I simply did it of my own free will. Therefore, I completely identify with whatever choices I make, and I remain ignorant about the biological, social, and cultural forces that have really shaped my decisions. This is how belief in free will becomes a big barrier to self-exploration and self-understanding. 
In the 21st century, the price we pay for ignorance about ourselves will increase dramatically because governments and corporations are now gaining unprecedented abilities to hack and manipulate human choice. And the easiest people to manipulate are those who believe in free will because they refuse to acknowledge that they can be manipulated. Like truthers. They think that they're not being manipulated when they're searching through the algorithm, the videos of truth, and they saw all sides. No, you didn't. You're only showing what the AI shows you the videos. I mean, when you search, you think you're going to find the truth? No, the AI will show you the top 10 or 20 or the first five pages in Google that it wants you to see. You think you really found the truth? No, you didn't. All right, so forget the philosophy and be very practical about it. Even if you believe in the theoretical possibility of free will, at least acknowledge that this possibility is not realized in each and every choice you make. So he, because he's more atheistic, to my knowledge, or maybe agnostic, either or, he doesn't believe in free will. Now, Christians, we do believe in free will, but he brings a very powerful point that even if there is free will, not every choice you make is. Because you are influenced by something. And that one we can agree with as Christians. We can agree with as Christians. Something manipulates us. Freedom isn't something you automatically have. It is something you must struggle for. In 99% of cases, your choices aren't made freely but are shaped by various biological, social, and cultural forces. I would be happy to concede that there is such a thing as free will and that 1% of our decisions are made completely freely if in exchange people investigate more seriously. This is important, what shapes the other 99%. Now, you and I will not agree with him about that 99% is not of our free will, but we can agree with, with him on that we do have to seriously investigate what shapes that certain percentage that takes that where our free choice has no play. What is it? See, he argues social, cultural, and tech biological forces, especially technological, is more dangerous, don't you think so? I don't know if this is deep for you or you're letting the information process through your head, but I hope you're understanding so far, okay, because this is very serious. This is where our history is ending up in. We're seeing it right now. He wrote this book 2019, guys, 2019. He mentions right here... Uh, to succeed as such a daunting... Uh, nope, not this one. This, of course, the oldest advice in the book, know thyself. For thousands of years, philosophers and prophets have urged people to know themselves. But this advice was never more urgent than in the 21st century. Because unlike in the days of Lao Tse or Socrates, now you have serious competition. Coca-Cola, Amazon, Baidu, and the government are all racing to hack you. Not your smartphone, not your computer, and not your bank account. They are in a race to hack you and your organic operating system. You might have heard that we are living in the era of hacking computers, but that's not even half the truth. In fact, we are living in the era of hacking humans. The algorithms are watching you right now. They are watching where you go, what you buy, whom you meet. Soon they will monitor all your steps, all your breaths, all your heartbeats. They are relying on big data and machine learning to get to know you better and better. And once these algorithms know you better than you know yourself, <laughs> they can control and manipulate you. And you won't be able to do much about it. You will live in the Matrix or in the Truman Show. In the end, it's a simple empirical matter. If the algorithms indeed understand what's happening within you better than you understand it yourself, authority will shift to them. Now, what does this mean right here? So... I guess good news for some of you or bad news, I don't know. I'll have to do another history lesson. I can't finish all this. Okay. All right, because I have to explain all this. So in other words, what he's talking about, which some of you can get it, some of you probably don't get it, but the idea is he's arguing you got to know yourself very well. A lot of us don't pay attention to ourselves. Let's be honest. You don't pay attention to yourself when you're doing this, when you're doing this. 
Time just flies by and you just don't catch it. Why? You're not catching yourself. You're not paying attention to yourself. You think you are paying attention to yourself, but try video recording yourself as you're going through your phone or your video games or your computer. And it might be a little bit eye-opening when you look at yourself and you might go, is that me? Why am I doing that? Have you ever video recorded yourself after you finished doing this or this or this? And noticed how your behavior, your reactions after you've done this all day? Compared to coming to church, getting fired up after a revival meeting, going street preaching and all that, video record your behavior, your manners. Video record yourself after that. And notice the drastic difference. If you won't video record yourself, God will at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why I'm saying you got to open, wake up. You got to smell the coffee right now. So you, a lot of you don't realize you are not yourselves. You think you are in control, but you're not. A lot of, if you don't really know yourself, like Yuval Noah Harari argues, then what's going to happen is then these algorithms will control you. But here's the thing, as Bible-believing Christians, uh, that phrase, know thyself, there is a partial truth. The partial truth is we have to always have a self-awareness. We have to be on guard of our flesh, right? That's what we mean by know thyself, but not to these guys. Know thyself to these guys is something demonic. It's something that goes back to Aleister Crowley, if I'm, not, if I'm uh, incorrect or not, I don't know. But it goes all the way back to them where, where they believe is that you got to find out your true desires, what's truly in you which you don't know until you discover yourself. And you might go, through what means? You've all know Harari will tell you, all right? And I'm going to show you what that is. And that is exactly, listen, that is exactly what Alex Jones and Jordan Peterson are, go, are trying to tell the people too, the same thing. It's the same satanic spirit, globalist agenda. And you thought those guys were truthers. If you're not a Bible-believing Christian, you will get caught up by the Antichrist spirit one way or the other. That's a big warning. That's why you got to get yourselves into a Bible-believing church. You might say, why? Because I showed you from our history chart so that you can be part of this Bible-believing movement, Bible-believing people. That's the only last-standing group that has the truth. Not truthers online. Why? Because you're all being controlled by this AI thing. All right, now, let's continue reading on here. <clears throat> this is scary. Of course, you might be perfectly happy ceding all authority to the algorithms and trusting them to decide things for you and for the rest of the world. Why? Because we're in Laodicea, remember? We want to be comfortable. We want robots to take care of things for us. We want technology. We want cars to take care of things for us, to drive us to the place. We want cell phones to take th care of things for us, make the workload easier. We do. L let's be honest. You and I, I'm including myself, we want that. Our flesh wants that. You think you're in control? I don't think so. Our flesh has really gotten a hold of us. Technology feeds our flesh. It feeds the Laodicean mindset. And what's going to happen is pretty soon, you're uh, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. There's no control, all right, except this AI. So somebody has to take charge of this AI to make sure everything goes smoothly. See, that's where you get this elitist then who can take charge of this AI and make sure everything is done in decently and in order. Why elites? Because they don't believe in God. They are not going to entrust their authority to God or the word of God. And that's the reason why they want to entrust elites to take care of it or a certain group of people. All right, continuing on. If so, just relax and enjoy the ride, he says, if you just want to yield to the algorithms. You don't need to do anything about it. The algorithms will take care of everything. If, however, you want to retain some control over your personal existence and the future of life, you have to run. This is scary. 
You have to run faster than the algorithms. No stinking way we can do that. Faster than Amazon and the government. No stinking way we can do that. And get to know yourself before they do. Why? Because Big Brother's watching you, everything. Amazon, Google, Facebook already knows you. AI already knows you. What you click, what you watch, what you like, what you want, what you're buying. To run fast, don't take much baggage with you. Leave all your illusions behind. They are very heavy. So this sounds a little new age. You notice that? So he's saying that to be free from this technology, you got to get into this new age thing. But that's trading a spirit with another spirit. All right, but anyway, I'll show you that later on, all right? That's the spirit that Jordan Peterson and Alex Jones are getting into. See, that New Age stuff. That's why they brag about, you know, doing, knowing yourself, meditation, and all that kind of garbage. All right, uh, I didn't mention that page number. That was page 274, okay, 274. And then this one is 33, all right, page 33. Now, he's giving an example of how, how scary it is, technology, Okay. Alpha Zero is not the only imaginative software out there. Many programs now routinely outperform human chess players. That's an example of how AI is better than you in talent, in capability, in getting the job done. What does that mean? That means humans are no longer necessary in the workforce then. If they can have computers do the work for you, you know what Yuval Noah Harari is talking about? He's talking about you might lose a job pretty soon. Let me keep reading. Uh, they're outperforming human chess players, not just in brute calculation, but even in, check this out, creativity. You know what that means? Do you know why people are still using humans in the workforce? You're creative. That's different from computers. But guess what? Computers through artificial intelligence, they're learning to become creative. Now, this is from a liberal secular scholar, guys. Okay? This ain't Christian conspiracy theory. In human-only chess tournaments, judges are constantly on the lookout for players who try to cheat by secretly getting help from computers. Did you know that? One of the ways to catch cheaters is to monitor the level of originality players display. If they play an exceptionally creative move, the judges will often suspect that it cannot be possibly a human move. It must be a computer move. At least in chess, creativity is always considered to be the trademark of computers rather than humans. So if chess is our canary in the coal mine, we are duly warned that the canary is dying. What is happening today to human AI chess teams might happen down the road to human AI teams in policing, medicine, and banking too. Do you easily see how a mark of the beast can be set up where you can't really buy or sell, eat or drink or work in a job without 666? Because AI is doing that. It can be, notice how this can be connected very easily. You notice how AI depends on certain marks too? for it to run and process. You go home and pray about that, okay. Consequently, creating new jobs and retaining uh, people, excuse me, let me, to fill them will not be a one-time effort. Whoa, that's, that's a problem, right? So we can't fix this. The AI revolution won't be a single watershed event after which the job market will just settle into a new equilibrium. No way. It will rather be a cascade of ever bigger disruptions. It's, in other words, it ain't going to calm down, guys. We're not going to adapt or catch up. AI will keep progressing. Already today, few employees expect to work in the same job for their entire life. By 2050, that's not too far, all right? In other words, uh, a lot of you are going to live to that day, all right? Not only the idea of a job for life, but even that of a profession for life might seem antediluvian. Wow. Just like the times of Noah. Larkin called it the antediluvian era. 
Even if we could constantly invent new jobs and retrain the workforce, we might wonder whether the average human would have the emotional stamina necessary for a life of such endless upheavals. No, we don't. That's why some of you have to always be trained in Google and Facebook and all that. Why? There's an update. That's why some of you can't stand it when there's an update on this stupid little thing and you have to learn how to do this. That's why parents are so scared that six-year-olds are better than them in computers than grown adults who are in their 40s and 50s. Why? Because they know the newer updates, whereas the older generation only knows the older ones. Change is always stressful, and the hectic world of the early 21st century has produced a global epidemic of stress as a Volatility of the job market and of individual careers, uh, careers increases. Will people be able to cope? We will probably need far more effective stress reduction techniques, ranging from drugs, well, that's encouraging, right. to neurofeedback to meditation. Well, that's better. Yeah. New age stuff. To prevent the human mind from snapping. Ain't that an encouragement to you? Yeah. Imagine what you would be without being a Bible-believing Christian. Do you imagine you wouldn't cope with this life or cult culture? All right. The future of the masses will then depend on the goodwill of a small elite. Maybe there is goodwill for a few decades, but in a time of crisis like climate catastrophe, it would be very tempting and easy to toss the superfluous people overboard. In countries such as France and New Zealand, with a long tradition of liberal beliefs and welfare state practices, perhaps the elite will go on taking care of the masses, even when it doesn't need them. So you see what he's trying to get at? He's saying that uh, our... Our hopes, then, will be for a small bunch of elites. Why? They can take control of the AI, society, government, provide the funds and the power, etc. So maybe we can entrust them. But he's warning right here that elites won't even need the people. So he's now talking about possibilities where maybe you might be necessary to the elites, or maybe they won't really need you. So let's look at all those possibilities. And this, look, again, I'm not reading from c Christian conspiracy theorists, okay? <clears throat> In the more capitalist United States, however, the elite might use the first opportunity to dismantle what's left of the American welfare state. An even bigger problem looms in large developing countries such as India, China, South Africa, and Brazil. There, once common people lose their economic value, inequality might skyrocket. What does that mean? In other words, these people are not necessary for the economy. Why? Because robots are controlling everything. You're, you're out of a job. Consequently, instead of globalization resulting in global unity, it might actually result in speciation, the divergence of humankind, listen, into different biological case or different species. What? Did you hear what I'm reading right here? What does that mean? That means biological systems change. And you thought that was sci-fi. You thought that that was weirdo Genesis 6 stuff. Globalization will unite the world horizontally by erasing national borders. Wonderful, racism is out of the picture. But it's not, see, that's the devil's game. You think you're divided because of racism. No, it's not going to be racism because they want to control every race. That's why they want them to unite. But it's still discrimination. There's still superiority of classes because it's what? It's elites versus the lower case. Tricky, tricky devil. You blind younger generation thinking the enemy is racism. You're so blind, man. Totally blind. You're just helping the elite's global world order system. All right. But look at this. But it will simultaneously divide humanity vertically. What did he mean by that? Here it is. Ruling oligarchies and countries as diverse as the United States and Russia. Oh, 
They're so diverse, wonderful. Might merge and make common cause against the mass of ordinary humans. Ordinary people, the working class force. Why? You're no longer a working class force. They don't need you. Give more tax to these big wigs? Really? All right, anyway, continuing on. From this perspective, current populist resentment of the elites is well-founded. If we are not careful, the grandchildren of Silicon Valley tycoons and Moscow billion billionaires might become a separate species superior to the grandchildren of Appalachian hillbillies and Siberian villagers. In the long run, such a scenario might even de-globalize the world. So what they want with globalization, it's actually going to de-globalize. In other words, what they want to set up more new world order so that everyone can live happily ever after will actually turn into chaos, destruction. Doesn't that sound like the book of Revelation? The Antichrist wants to set up new world order peace, but it turns out to be more chaos, destruction, war coming out, not peace. <clears throat> All right, let's keep reading right here. Uh, let's see. It's going to deglobalize the world. Why? As the uppercase congregates, that's the Antichrist, that's the elites, all right? Inside a self proclaimed, look at this, civilization, and builds walls and moats to separate it from the hordes of barbarians outside. That's you and me. In the 20th century, industrial civilization depended on the barbarians for cheap labor. Even communists need that, the working class force. But what happens when you get a communist set up when you don't need the working class force? Scary? Raw materials and markets, and it often conquered and absorbed them. But in the 21st century, a post-industrial civilization relying on AI, bio, oh, come on, okay, bioengineering and nanotechnology might be far more self-contained and self-sustaining. Think about it. You get rid of the working class force, wouldn't that help you with depopulation? Wouldn't that help save Earth, your mother Earth, with global warming and all that? Aren't elites really getting onto climate change? Why? They still want a kingdom to run. But they want you gone. Now, I'm not saying all of them do, but, some, but notice right here, it's leading to this. And personally, myself, I believe some of them do, if not most. Not just entire classes, but entire countries and continents might become irrelevant. Wow. Fortifications guarded by drones and robots might separate the self-proclaimed civilized zone where cyborgs fight one another with logic bombs from the barbarian lands where feral humans fight one another with machetes and kalashnikovs. That sounds like the days of Noah, right? There was violence in the earth in those days. Think about it. It's repeating. It's repeating Genesis 6. We're getting there. Throughout this book, I often use the first person plural to speak about the future of humankind. I talk about what we need to do about our problems, but maybe there is no we. Maybe one of our biggest problems is that different human groups have completely different, hum different futures. Maybe in some parts of the world, you should teach your kids to write computer code, while in others, you had better teach them to draw fast and shoot straight. What does that mean? Basically, learn how to live in a barbaric world in shooting fast, drawing straight survival mode, or catch up with the technology, the AI. Adapt to that culture. Follow the Antichrist system. Take 666 and you'll survive. That's why Tribulation Saints, it makes a lot of sense, they're in survivor mode running to the mountains. That's how they can survive. Why? They can't keep up with the Antichrist AI technology. They refuse that mark. Is this eye-opening or what? This is incredibly eye-opening. This change, it's opening your eyes more about our history when you look back at your past now, what the devil has done. How did it all start? It started with the lust of your flesh giving into it. It just started with that. 
and then it just drowns you now where the devil controls you. Okay, now, more. I still got a lot more here, okay. So this is uh, Yuval Noah Harari's answer to be saved from this kind of a world. Oh, how wonderful, all right. You'll hear this similar thing from Alex Jones and Jordan Peterson too, so you'll know you got the truth. Here we go. I know this from personal experience. When I publish a book, my publishers ask me to write a short description that they use for publicity online. But they have a special expert who adapts what I write to the taste of the Google algorithm. See, he admits that technology is even in control of his works. The expert goes over my text and says, don't use this word, use that word instead. Then we will get more attention from the Google algorithm. We know that if we can just catch the eye of the algorithm, we can take the humans for granted. So if humans are neither needed as producers nor as consumers, what will safeguard their physical survival and their psychological well-being? You notice that? He's saying that humans are not even worthy to be consumers too. Why? Because AI can be its own consumer for you to keep the economy running. They don't need you as consumers. You're irrelevant. We cannot wait for the crisis to erupt in full force before we start looking for answers. By then, it will be too late in order to cope with the unprecedented technological and economic disruptions of the 21st century. We need to develop new social and economic models as soon as possible. These models should be guided by the principle of protecting humans rather than jobs. So what's his proposal? One new model gaining increasing intention is universal basic Income. That's your solution? That sounds like 666 all over again. Where you, and no one can buy or sell except you have the mark. All right. And government taking care of you too. That's what he proposes. It sounds like antichrist government. See, these guys, they're so intellectually smart. They're so stupid. They repeat back to ground zero again. You know why we can see their stupidity? We already know that book. But if you don't know 666, Revelation, or that book, you would think that this is a great idea. You would be just as stupid as them. That's why I keep urging you Christians, get into a Bible-believing church, study that book more than you know your internet or your TV. Got to get into that. That's the only truth that unlocks everything. If you've been spending, I just want to say this last thing, all right? I know a lot of people watch me online And I have a burden for you. I care about you guys. If you spend more time on this than reading that book and getting involved in a Bible-believing church, man, that's serious. I'm talking about you right now. You're contributing to this. Even if you're not going to be a part of this system, you're contributing to this still. UBI proposes that that's the universal basic income. That governments tax the billionaires and corporations controlling the algorithms and robots and use that money to provide every person with a generous stipend covering his or her basic needs. This will cushion the poor against job loss and economic dislocation while protecting the rich from populist rage. That still sounds like 666. The Bible says in Revelation 13, whether rich or poor, that they receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. A related idea proposes to widen the range of human activities that are considered to be jobs. At present, billions of parents take care of children, neighbors look after one another, and citizens organize communities without any of these valuable activities being recognized as jobs. Maybe we need to flip a switch in our minds and realize that taking care of a child is arguably the most important and challenging job in the world. What's he saying? Lose a job. Focus on community, on people. Why? To keep yourself sane and happy. So think about that. If the Antichrist has a bunch of happy people with his government feeding them, he can keep controlling them. Isn't that what the world's doing right now? Making you lost in, you know, your social connections with one another and all that? You know why people don't want to end up in a Bible-believing church? They're afraid to be socially stereotyped, discriminated, or cut off by the social world. Why? They look at you Bible-believing Christians as weird. 
That's why teens fall into peer pressure and they have to go with the in crowd. That's why grown adults fall into pressure and they go with the in crowd in schools or in jobs or their neighbors because they don't want to be known as that weird Jesus freak. If so, there won't be a shortage of work, even if computers and robots replace all the drivers, bankers. Oh, that's just comforting. The super rich and that the future will be even worse for them and their children. Homo sapiens is just not built for satisfaction. Human happiness depends less on objective conditions and more on our own expectations. Expectations, however, tend to adapt to conditions, including the conditions of other people. When things improve, expectations balloon, and so even dramatic improvements in conditions might leave us as dissatisfied as before. If universal basic support is aimed at improving the objective conditions of the average person in 2050, it has a fair chance of succeeding. Of succeeding. But if it is aimed at making people subjectively more satisfied with their lot and preventing social discontent, it is likely to fail. To really achieve its goals, universal basic support will have to be supplemented with some meaningful pursuits. Okay, so basically what he's saying is if to provide them happiness, support through the social community, it's got to be more specific. Can't just be whatever a per makes a person happy, that abstract. We gotta find out specifically what it is. He argues this, ranging from sports to religion. Perhaps so, religion. That's how the Antichrist can make everybody worship his religion. That's why Hollywood, people view them as idols or as gods still, the actresses and the singers. See, in other words, you gotta give them some meaningful uh, pursuit. <clears throat> that's dangerous. Perhaps the most successful experiment so far in how to live a contented life in the post-work world has been conducted in Israel. Oh, no wonder the Antichrist will choose that nation. He wants to go back to Israel, rule as God, start his own religion. And according to Harari, they found that that religion can give people meaning and happiness. There, about 50% of ultra-Orthodox Jewish men never work. They dedicate their lives to studying holy scriptures and performing religious rituals. They and their families don't starve partly because the wives often work and partly because the government provides them with generous subsidies and free services, making sure that they don't lack the basic necessities of life. How about that? The Antichrist says, just get involved in this religious worship, helping our fellow people in this community through my Antichrist religion, and we'll take care of you. And of course, it will be done through Judaism because the Antichrist will be Jewish himself. That's universal basic support avant la lettre. Although they are poor and unemployed in survey after survey, these ultra-Orthodox Jewish men report higher levels of life satisfaction than any other section of Israeli society. How about that? Let's wrap it up here. This is due to the strength of their community bonds as well as to the deep meaning they find in studying scripture and performing rituals. A small room full of Jewish men discussing the Talmud might well generate more joy, engagement, and insight than a huge textile sweatshop full of hardworking factory hands. In global surveys of life satisfaction, Israel is usually somewhere near the top thanks in part to the contribution of these jobless poor people. Secular Israelis often complain bitterly that the ultra-Orthodox, uh, excuse me, uh, I'll end it right here. So that one is on uh, page 43, on page 43. Okay, so uh, makes you very positive about the future of our society and world, doesn't it? <laughs> is history more eye-opening now to you, where we're heading toward? All right, uh, Lord Willie, next history class will be our final. All right, so we'll close it off here. We got to end it off in hope, amen, not in gloom. But you need to understand this gloom where we're heading toward first. Father God, I pray that today's history lesson has been a blessing to the hearers and open our eyes more to the truth. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, we will not follow the pattern of the world, but get involved in a Bible-believing church, read our Bibles, grow as Bible-believing Christians in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.